If you go over to Galatians 1, down about verse 15, Galatians 1, 15, this is Paul writing. It says, but when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. He goes on from there. So he's talking about when he met Christ on the road here to, to Damascus, right? And when he was converted um, in Damascus, it says, he says, when Christ was pleased to do this, when God was pleased to do this, I didn't immediately consult with flesh and blood, meaning people, in verse 17. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, and, and it goes on from there. Stayed with him 15 days, okay? So we're in the end of Acts 9. We're talking about Saul going to Jerusalem about how much time has passed between when he became a Christian and when he goes to Jerusalem. About three years. And we also know he didn't stay there in Damascus the whole time he left. He came back and then he went to Jerusalem. Okay, so it's just a little gap to be filled in there. We don't know what exactly happened in three years. We have some allusions perhaps to it later on. But we know that some time has passed. So then when we come down to Acts 9, and we look at verse 26, and it says, When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. Not for a week, right? Not for a month, but for three years he had been known in some areas, Damascus, and then would go on for three years and then come back, gone for, to Arabia. Some people say, well, maybe it was Mount Sinai, all these different things, we don't know. But then he came back, and he's been doing this for three years. So when he comes to Jerusalem, Barnabas speaks up for him and says, yes, he really, he can be trusted. And we mentioned on Wednesday that that word, he tried to associate with them. He tried, some of your translations probably say, to join to them or join them do, do, do we still do that today? We do, right? So he wanted to associate or join the local church in Jerusalem to associate with those people. We have people now that come in and they visit with us from some other state, some other country, who knows? And they say, no, we, we'd like to worship here once they learn about us. And then what do we do? We say, well, let's talk to you. And we have a little bit of a meeting with the elders. And we say, well, tell us about yourself. Should we, can we, we'd, we'd love to, but can we associate with them? Is it, is it safe? Is it good? Is it proper? Um, so in this case, they really have a big, we don't have a lot of people that we're concerned are going to murder us, come and, and worship with us, right? But we do have sometimes people that obviously aren't Christians and need more study or need help in some way. Um, and so we still do that to an extent. And then... Someone sometimes might have to speak up. So, oh, yeah, I've known them. If someone here comes to visit you, your family comes to visit, and they've moved here, and you say, oh, yeah, this is my family. I know them for a long time. They've, they've been faithful Christians a long time. Well, then it's, it's a pretty easy process, right? And, um, and so we always try to tell folks that it's not difficult. There's no taking of blood. There's no fingerprints. There's you know, nothing like that. It's just a get-to-know-me time. But it's been done since Acts 9. And... So from there, he, at, at, at verse 28, and he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. How long was he there, according to what we read just a little while ago? About 15 days. So he did a lot of work in about 15 days, spoke out so much that they, they had to, to help him get away because they were, the folks there were attempting to put him to death. Verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase. Now, we're going to shift, but I want to, I want to talk about one more thing about Saul, Paul here. In chapter 9, after he's converted, what is his name called read it over about verse 
let's see, 22, verse 22. What's his name there? That continues a long time. Go over to Acts 13, 9. Go over to Acts 13, 9. What's that? You did this? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Acts 13, 9. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him. And that's a whole other story we're going to come to a little later on. Have you ever heard somebody say, oh, God renamed Paul or Saul? That, it's not a thing, okay? Just, just know that's not what the Bible teaches. Did he do that any time in the Bible? I can think of at least a couple examples. Abraham, he, 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 and you can look it up, he said, your name now shall be Abram. Well, there's another big one. Change the name of a people forever. Jacob, Esau, I mean, uh, I, Esau, that's too funny. Israel, your name now shall be Israel. He, that didn't happen to Paul, Saul. Just which, which one sounds more uh, Jewish to you most likely? Saul, why? Why would that be Jewish, Hebrew? Why would that be a Hebrew name? Yeah, ever heard King Saul, right? That would make sense. That would be a popular Hebrew name. Paul, Greek, more Greek. That's all it was. So as his ministry starts changing and who he's in front of, Hebrews versus Gentiles, then pretty much it all becomes Paul, Paul, Paul from there. Does that make sense? So I just figured I'd clarify that because every once in a while you hear somebody give a big story about this and it's, it's really not biblical. Okay, so if you go over to... Um, She's laughing at me, and I'm not sure when that one. Oh, okay, good. All right, different story. The, um, now, as um, verse, verse 32. Now, as Peter was traveling through all those regions, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas who had been bedridden eight years, for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. Immediately he got up. The only thing I'm going to mention there is you notice that clearly who Paul say healed him. Uh, Peter, who Peter say healed him. Jesus. Jesus Christ heals you. And that's a, a very common theme that they always give the credit to Christ. Now in Joppa, verse 36, was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dor Dorcas. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. And it happened at that time that she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upper room. Is there any confusion, biblically speaking, that she was dead? It says she died, right? That she died. They didn't think there was any confusion either. They washed her body, laid it in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, imploring him, Peter, do not delay in coming to us. So Peter arose and went with them. When he arrived, they brought him into the upper room, and all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. Evidently a hardworking, diligent Christian woman. Verse 40. But Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. And calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. It became known all over Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. We're going to come back to that part. A tan he was staying there with a tanner named Simon. As I've said before, we don't have a lot of time. So that last part, I think is pretty self-explanatory. Does anybody have anything that we'd want to add until we go into Acts 10 with the story of Cornelius? No? Okay, good. Not good. Okay, I understand. The um, Acts 10 and 11, all the handouts got taken, I noticed this morning. I printed a bunch out, so I'm glad you're using them. Um, Acts 12 is already out there as well. I didn't mention that earlier, so we'll be going through potentially a lot of 11 today and in Acts 12 on Wednesday, okay? So we'll see how that goes. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian court, uh, cohort, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. A couple of terms there. Um, Centurion. What does that mean? Leader of 100 men, right? What's an Italian cohort? You might know. It, it may say over on the right hand side, there's one translation that says battalion. It might have been 600 people. It could have been up to about 1,000 people, okay? The significant part there isn't that it was 600 to 1,000. The significant part to me is really it's called the Italian cohort, okay? Where was Rome? Part of that central part of Italy, right? 
These are, these are locals, you might say. These are diligent, talented, determined fighting men. Okay, this isn't some a, a place where they went and, 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 and grabbed a bunch of folks and said, you will fight for us, right? These are, this, is the, this is some of the best of the best. It's, it, yeah, that's a good point. They're there. They're not in. Thank you. They're an occupying force. Exactly right. So he was one who feared God. And, and you'll see different ideas about this. Personally, I don't think he was a proselyte in the, in the normal sense. I don't think that this is a man who had converted entirely to, um, to, be, to Judaism. Um, because this big sign wouldn't be necessary for a proselyte. How do we know that? It's something we've already studied here. Did we already talk about some proselytes? The eunuch, thank you very much. The eunuch was worshiping there. And we have someone that was actually named a proselyte and a leader in the church. Can you think of who that was? You're not going to remember the name probably. What was that? I can't hear you. Nicolaus, was he one of the seven? That's the guy I'm thinking about, okay? So Nicolaus, when they had one of the seven full of wisdom and the spirit that were supposed to be taking care of the Hellenistic Jews, it literally says he was a proselyte. Did God come down and the Holy Spirit come down in a miraculous fashion and had to have a vision to let the apostles know that Nicolaus was able to be part of the church? No, he was a proselyte. He was already a practicing Jew. Does that make sense? Even though he wasn't born that way. So about the ninth hour of the day, and that's about 3 p.m. I don't know why I can't remember that. I had to look. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision, this is uh, Cornelius, an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius. And fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon who is also called Peter, he is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. So we met, we learned that in the chapter before, right, that he was staying with a man named Simon. Let's, let's pause right there for a second and go over to the next chapter, chapter 11. We know some things are going to happen here with Cornelius and his family. We know that Peter is going to have some things happen to him. But I want to, I want to read this part first instead of going back and forth too much. I think it'll be easier. So after these things happen where Cornelius and his family are going to believe, spoiler alert, I think everyone here is, has, has read Acts before. But now the apostles and the brethren who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him. These are Christians, Jews, right? Hebrews. Saying, you went to, an uns to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began speaking and proceeded to explain to them an orderly sequence, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object coming down like a great sheet lowered by four corners from the sky, and it came right down to me. And when I had fixed my gaze on it and was observing it, I saw the four-footed animals of the earth and the wild beasts and the crawling creatures and the birds of the air. And by the way, this won't make a lot of sense to you until we read the chapter before. I also heard a voice say to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing unholy or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a voice from heaven answered a second time, what God has cleansed, no longer consider it unholy. This happened three times and everything was, was drawn back up into the sky. And behold, at that moment, three men appeared at the house in which we were staying, having been sent to me from Caesarea. The spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. These six brethren, six of them, also went with me. So these are people that were, they were, these were Christians that were there, went and traveled with Peter. And we entered the man's house, and Cornelius' house. And he reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and have Simon, who is also called Peter, brought here. You see where that connects? Back to where we just got done reading, right? So he, the, the sky opened up. Let's, oh, I'm sorry. Verse 7, chapter 10. Um, Oh, actually, uh, verse 5, he's talking to the angel. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who's also called Peter. So what does the angel say there? In verse 13, we just said that he, in, in chapter 11, 13, send to Joppa and have Simon, who's also called Peter, brought here. Chapter 14 is the part I want to emphasize here. And he will, Peter will, speak words to you 
by which you will be saved, you and your whole household. Okay? How's he going to be saved? How's he, going to, how's he going to hear what he needs to do? Peter's going to tell him. He's going to give him the words by which he'll be saved, him and his whole household. So let's go back over to, to chapter 10 and verse 5. The angel's talking, dispatch the men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who's also called Peter. He's staying in a, with, a tan, with, with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel was, who was speaking to had left him, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he explained everything to him, he sent them to Joppa. So he's a centurion. He's got 100 men underneath him, right? He sends two servants, probably, looks like personal servants, and somebody from his command to go probably take care of them along the way. On the next day, protect them along the way. Verse 9. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up to the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. Okay, so we've had a whole perspective on one side. Cornelius is, has a vision of an angel who tells him that if he sends men to Joppa, there's a man there who will give him the words by which he needs to be saved, he and his whole household. So he sends two servants and a, and a protector of them, a devout soldier, and then we switch. And now we're at the, the perspective of, of Peter. It's about the sixth hour to pray, about noon the next day. Verse 10. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat. Uh, usually like 10, 10 a.m. or so. But evidently, the tradition basically says we're going to eat about mid-morning and then a second meal mid-early evening, not, not three meals like we do. So he's, he became hungry. It's already kind of late. And desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance, and he saw the sky opened up, verse 11, and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were, all ki- there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. A voice came up to him and said, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And now Peter's going to say, Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Can somebody give me a short idea of what that means? I've never. Here's all this food. Here's all these animals. But no way. I've never eaten anything unclean. Okay. So we have a law of Moses. Some things can't be eaten. We all know, what do we have? Pork, right? I don't know how people like pork. How, how, that's the biggest part of the old law to me. You can't eat bacon. The, I'm just kidding. The, um, there's a lot of things, though, on that list that they can't, they can't eat. They can't sacrifice. And you could go look. Again, it's not an Old Testament study. We've said that. You can go look at Leviticus 11. It will go down so many different kinds of examples. Clean, unclean. Uh, Deuteronomy 14, clean, unclean. Peter has lived his life faithfully to God, to Christ, Still living, though, faithfully observing Mosaic law, even though he now is under the gospel as well, right? The gospel to Peter is not separate from Mosaic law. It was a continuation of, it was a fulfillment of everything they had been told that we consider the Old Testament. Everything they had been told was fulfilled with Christ, right? It's not two separate things. So these laws that he'd been living under his whole life, He's still living under. He has never eaten bacon. Okay? So, he says, I've never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Verse 15. Again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. What God says is holy, don't consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate and calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. Before we continue, you look at verse uh, 11. I don't know that this is overly significant, but it is interesting to me. In verse 11, and he saw the sky opened up. Your translations have anything else? The heaven opened up. Can we think of another heavenly vision that we've read about recently with the exact same language there? Stephen, yeah. It it does say that the heaven opened up and he saw. 
And I, I don't know exactly why they chose sky here and heaven there other than maybe it's someone felt like it was a little different, but it's the same. They're, they're saying the exact same thing. And so here the heaven opened up and an angel spoke to Peter. There the heaven opened up and he got to see, Stephen got to see, did I just say that wrong? Here the heaven opened up and Peter got to hear the angel. Acts 7, the heaven opened up and uh, Stephen got to see Christ standing next to God. Okay. The, um, so, verse 17. He was perplexed. The men showed up who'd been sent by Cornelius, appeared at the gate. They called out in verse 18, verse 19. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. But get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So he invited them in and gave them lodging. Here's a man, had been a devout Hebrew his whole life, never eaten anything unclean, didn't want to eat anything unclean. Same day that he finds out God has something different intended, he lets these Gentiles stay with him. That's the first step right there. That's amazing to me. I don't, I haven't necessarily want to make a lot of side applications, but if we find something in the Bible that God has said that contradicts baggage we have from a former life, the best time to cut it loose is right then. Does that make sense? He immediately lets them stay. Same day, I don't know how many hours had passed, it sounded like none, right? It seemed to me like they showed up at the end of this vision and they have a discussion. The Holy Spirit says, God says, this is all right. And he lets them stay. And I think that's amazing to think about because how many times do we struggle with baggage from old teaching, old whatever that might have been that we had, and yet once God says, God says. Okay, so on the next day, verse 23, and on the next day he got up and went away with them, and some of the the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. How many? Six, right? We read that in the other chapter. It doesn't say right here. So six people accompanied him. Six of the brethren accompanied him. On the following day, he entered Caesarea. Now, Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. This is a big deal to him, right? It doesn't say they came in and they talked to the whole town or the whole city. But Cornelius brought together those who he loved and wanted them to know what these words that could save them were all about. Verse 25. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet. And worshiped him. But Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up, for I too am just a man. We haven't gotten there yet, but over in Acts 14, something similar happens to Paul. They fall down at feet. He says, This is when he's on an island, a shipwreck. And he says, oh, I am just a man. I'm just, don't, don't worship me. Don't fall down on your, on your knees. Now, probably this was a big sign of respect, but can you imagine a centurion from the Italian co- cohort on his knees, prostrate? Respect, right? Not necessarily, it does say worship, as a God worship, but certainly sent from God. Potentially, that's the way it was. Certainly, this huge sign of, of, of respect there. But Peter wants nothing to do with that. He said, don't do that. I'm just a man. I, I can't think of a particular religious leader in the world that for centuries expects everyone to bow down, which is, is kind of strange. But Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up, for I too am just a man. And as he talked with him, he entered and found, this verse 27, found many people assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That is why I came without even raising any objection when I was sent for. So I ask, For what reason you have sent me? Cornelius said, four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in shining garments. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. 
We read, we read that in the other chapter. Therefore, send to Joppa, invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon, the tanner, by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Verse 11, chapter 11, 14. He will speak to you by which you, words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. That's what he's talking about here. Verse 34, opening his mouth, what are the words that we've been waiting on that he's going to say? I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God appointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, and for God was with him. We are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. After he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify to this, that this is the one who has been appointed by God, a judge of the living and the dead, of him all the prophets bear witness, that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. And then he's interrupted. What's he doing here? What do we call that one word thing that he's just preached? The gospel. We've been saying that since Acts 2. Jesus Christ, Son of God, comes to earth, lives a perfect life. You killed him or we killed him. And then he rose from the dead. And through him, everyone can be saved. And if you go back to Mark, we read the end of Mark. How many times will we read that? Or you go to the beginning of Acts, the Great, the great Commission, every time it says... All nations, all creation, right? And yet, up to this time, it's basically been the Jews, the proselytes, but the, the Jews, right? And so, the end of Mark, those who believe the gospel and are baptized will be saved, right? So, you can imagine what the next thing is. You're, if you've read it without knowing it's going to happen, you're expecting a response that they're cut to the quick or pierced to the heart or they say, okay, what's the response? But in this case, they're interrupted. While Peter was speaking these words, verse 44, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, surely no one can refuse water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. Can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. We're going to come back to that in a second. But let's look over on verse 17 of the next chapter. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift... As he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? That's how he's explaining this later on. They were believing the gospel. They were believing the gospel. And God said, yep, this is right. This is real. This is true. Who am I to stand in God's way? So we baptize them just like the gospel says we should do. What time... This is strange, right? I, some of these things I don't reconcile very well in my own mind. They received the Spirit just as we did, Acts 2. They started speaking tongues, right? But he commanded them to be baptized. This was a sign. Were the apostles saved by the coming down of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2? I don't know. We have no reason to believe that that's what that was at all. This was a, hey, listen to them. This is from God. Um, did Cornelius and his family, did, they were speaking in tongues. Did they have some gifts beyond that? 
after they were baptized, could they go to people and put their hands on them and those people could get, get the Spirit? I don't, I don't think so. There's no indication of that, right? But this miraculous Spirit of the tongues coming down, the Holy Spirit there says, this is real. This is what I want. This is important. Do this. They are part of us. Just the same as all of these other people needed to see to prove that the gospel is the truth. Through the gospel, you can be saved if you are baptized. I don't have a better explanation than that. But I'm happy to hear anybody else's comments if you have them. Ronnie. It seems to me verse 18 of the 11th chapter says that very thing. Last sentence says, then, which is the word of conclusion, God has also granted to the Gentile repentance. Great. So the whole conclusion of all of this is the Gentiles that we accept. God said, God granted them the, the word that leads to repentance, the, the way they are, now, they are now the same. Were they the same before this? Yes. Was anybody acting on it? No. Because God had to show them that it was, it was the way. Yes. 1,500 years of culture had to be overcome in this moment. From the time of the law, Gentile, Jew, separation, now, that's all gone. And that's a major hurdle. Yeah. Um, did, to an extent, did, did Peter need that big miraculous thing to happen? Yeah, he's having to explain himself in chapter 11 about doing this. How else would he have done it? If he had six, six witnesses that saw all of these things happen, and they have to say, yes, we saw these things happen. He needed this, otherwise it's going to be a mess. God stepped in miraculously to clarify things, not miraculously to save someone, as we've said a lot of times. They were told they were going to hear the words by which they could be saved. And just like a point that I was thinking was made by Ronnie the other day when it came to the, um, the Ethiopian eunuch, the spirit worked. The spirit worked before. An angel showed up, tore Cornelius to go send Peter. The, the, the vision that Peter had that said, well, that was the other one, yes. This one, though, that he, he sent Cornelius, he told Cornelius to go send for Peter. This, the, the, the vision that told Peter you can eat these things. What God has made clean, don't say is unclean. And Peter goes, and there's a miraculous event that says this is right. But none of the miracles were what led to salvation. They believed what they heard, and they were baptized and saved. Yes? That's the same here. You've already said it twice. You've read the verse. Verse 14, chapter 11. Who will tell you words by which you will be saved? You and your household will be saved. The means of salvation came by listening to the words and obeying those words, not what the Holy Spirit did, not the gifts of the Holy Spirit, not any of those kind of things were part of, of actually saving them. They were for the purpose of identifying the Gentiles as being people that could be taught and were responsible for the gospel. Exactly right. So let's go to a, 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 in the last verse there, verse 48. They ordered them. That's not a, there's no question about that. They, he ordered them to be baptized. Do you want to be saved? Surely no one can stop this. Somebody got a hand up. Sorry, did I skip somebody? What? Way over there. Thank you. Yes, sir. Spirit on all flesh. That's right. And we could go example after example after example after example of how the apostles never really got that. Right? They never really did. But now they do. Now it's clear, 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 clear. And so, verse 48, they ask him to stay on for a few days. Then Peter, chapter 11, defends what had happened, explains what had happened. And I love this. So go down to um, chapter 11, the end of verse 17. Who was I that I could stand in God's way? Verse 18, chapter 11. 
when they heard this, these are the disciples back in Jerusalem, they quieted down and glorified God saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Now, we're probably not going to have much more time than just this. This is one of my, I don't know how the high schoolers feel about it. There's a couple of them that used to be in the high school when, I, when we went through Acts. One of my favorite things. Do you see the resentment here of, oh, how dare could God do this? He lets these other people in. No, none of that. It, oh, we get it. Excellent. You mean to tell me that well, everyone can be saved now? That others can be saved? Never, never, never should we somehow rejoice in the idea that someone's being excluded. That would be awful, right? That would be awful. In fact, I think even when we explain the gospel, even when we explain baptism, even when we explain some things in the Bible, our heart's hope should be that all could be saved. Maybe we're more restrictive than God even is. I hope that's the case. I hope that God, that I've gotten it wrong. I hope to an extent that, hey, you know what? I say these things are necessary, but God really never meant it that way, and he's going to save so many more people. I would rejoice in that. I don't think that's the case. But wouldn't it be cool if we had a church down the road, a, a, a group of people meeting down the road two minutes from here, and we found out that they have a whole different name. We don't know a, number, a single one of them, and yet... They're preaching the gospel and they're teaching that if you believe the gospel and are baptized, you can be saved. And we should all rejoice with that idea, right? That would be excellent. Instead of thinking, oh, I hope they've got it wrong. I think they've got it. No. And I don't think we really go that far here. I don't know any of you that do. But after a lifetime of understanding this one way, that these Christians continue to follow Christ. And then when they're told it really did mean everyone when it said everyone. It said, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, well, then God has granted to these Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. I've got about one minute. Yes, David. That's right. This has never happened. Now he's got it. Oh, when God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your time.